morning, Friday, September 1st, 2023, 3.36 in the morning, welcome to the fourth watch. Once again, look at us. Look at us right here. Look at us. Look at this place. It's our money. We own it, <laughs> but we can't go in. We don't own it. We don't own anything anymore. For everyone that wants to believe that this is still a thing, it's pageantry. I have friends that operate here. For all intents and purposes, pageantry. There's nothing else. You can't even go in and have a conversation unless you go through a bunch of hoops. I'm sure they've got more important things to do than talk to people like us, but it's the perception of a thing that gets me. All right, the perception versus reality. Perception is, this is our place. This is where our people do things that we want them to do and elect them to do, and the reality is that's not the case anymore. This place represents what they want to do, who they are, what they're about, their values, their norms, their money, their bankroll, their bank accounts, their investments, their portfolio. That's what this place is about. This place is about how much can they get away with, yet still have the public appear to be on the same page with, like they're, they're doing the right job and the right thing. It doesn't exist anymore. Constitutional Republic on paper, maybe by name only, but this doesn't exist anymore. It's not like this place is here to serve anyone besides themselves and self-interest. I say this with a heavy heart. These people are of us. These politicians are from us. These politicians are elected by us. They come from us. Why do we expect anything different? This is society. This is our culture. So let's say, for example, you want to say, no, these people should be better. They should be doing the right thing. The rich men north of Richmond. That's assuming that we can elect people from society, from us, and have them be better than us. And they want to be better than us. They want to be more respectable, more trustworthy, more honorable. Why do we expect that? Why are we lying to ourselves? Why do we keep asking more of other people than we ask of ourselves? Just look at the investment data. Look at the backlog of all the insider trading where these people have made very strategic moves with publicly traded companies moments, minutes before something is leaked out and a company of this or that is awarded a, a this or a that. Are they telling you that or just themselves? Oh, that's right, just themselves, capitalizing on it. So listen, I don't blame them. I don't blame any of these people. They're from us, they're of us. Why would I blame someone for acting like the rest of society? That's stupid, it's idiotic, it's childish, it's actually immature. I'm not trying to say, look at me, I'm above this. By the way, I'm actually low-key surprised because usually there are like way more gates around this place. You can't even get close to this thing without having all these gates and guards come up and harass you, harass you. But I say this only for the reality that we need to repent, all of us, for our expectation. Start there. Father, I repent for expecting politicians to be better than me. For politicians to be upstanding, upworthy people of society when you steal pens and pencils from work thinking it's okay. But I'm saying all this because if we can't deal with the plank in our own eye, double standards of selfishness, of self-interest, of self-love, where society is taking advantage of every single situation possible without really looking out for the greater good, right? That's nobility. Nobility is you look out for the greater good even to your detriment. There's nothing noble about it. And what does the Bible say? Think on things that are true. Think on things that are noble. So is that just how far we should go? We just think about it, we stop. We don't actually like take a role and play action in it. If we can't repent and get past ourselves and understand that we are in such a belligerent, arrogant state to think that we can elect government officials to be better people than us, we are the problem, it's not them. It's us. So if we corporately are repenting, if we corporately are saying like, hey, um, yeah, we can do better. And cool, we should do that. But we're not doing that, are we? Correct me if I'm wrong. We got generators up here. There used to be actually like massive walls around this place. I think at this point, they don't even care. I think at this point, most people don't come out anymore because the homeless are all here. And if the homeless are here, you know, you don't want to be panhandled to death. Look at that. Oh, it's under construction too. Look at the outside. Because somehow, you know, they weren't getting away with more of our tax dollars. They can just clean up the outside of it, spruce it up a bit, make it look cute. I will show you video. I'll try and find video of us walking around this place where the fence is like, it's two people high. It's two of me high. It's a joke. There it is. If you want to see it up close, one last time before they build walls around it. Here it is. We'll get a better shot in a second. But it's a low key, no joke. Whole time Trump was in office, we couldn't even get this close. But here we are. Looks very official. If you're wondering why we walk around here and pray, wondering what the point is, it's because God's not done and neither are we. Until we're dead, until you have no more air in your lungs, God is not done. God wants to have his people of use. God wants to set things in motion. We're the ones that end up getting in the way. But if we don't show up, if we don't speak up, Okay, that's one thing. But what happens? Evil flourishes when good men do nothing. Good men are doing nothing. And I get it, it all comes back down to the perception of a thing versus the reality of a thing. Perception of what we had, of rights. Perception of, you know, voting people into power and positions and places that our vote mattered. Again, the perception of a thing versus the reality of a thing. Again, we have to repent because these people come from us, from our culture and our society. And if we think that 
we can have good people, benevolent people that have nothing but our interest at heart. Why? What gives us that impression? Who told you that's even possible, attainable? Who told you it's even on the table? And if you say, oh, well, there are still good people, okay, show me. Where in there are there good people? Look at that, it's all hidden. The building is hidden. Their intentions are hidden. Their effort, hidden. Their actions, hidden. You can't get a clear idea of who they are, what they're doing, and how they're doing it. Why is it most of them go in poor and leave wealthier? We have to abandon our own arrogant position that these people are somehow going to be better than us, more honorable, more decent, more law-abiding, and somehow less self-interested. That's on us, that's not on them. I don't blame anyone for taking advantage of an office like that. Power corrupts. And it's not about being fear-based, it's just reality. Power corrupts. And if you don't understand how that works, it's because you haven't had enough to know what it feels like. Which means get off your high, lofty, ignorant horse and understand that if you wanna see effective change, if you actually wanna see something change in this place, this whole city, this whole region, this, this district, this region, this nation and the world, it starts with you, first and foremost in prayer. Repent, on your knees, humble yourself before God. If you understand how God opposes the proud, what does it mean? He's in active opposition of people that are proud. He's using all the pride that's operating in that building. He's using it. He's allowing it to build up and to be actionable on every front. You say, well, why would a loving God do that? Because we don't love him. Why do we get all of God's love and we give him none in return? We don't love God. If we loved God, we would read his book. We'd take it seriously. We'd be in a relationship. We would pray. We would do the things that God wants us to do. So for all you people who think that a loving God wouldn't leave us to our own devices, again, it's just foolishness. I don't, I don't know how to talk to you. I don't even know if you're worth talking to. I don't know if you're worth speaking to. There are nations around this world where your worst problem is their dream to have. We are ripe with first world problems. And guess what? All the first world problems, they're hitting everyone different. So first and foremost, be grateful for the problems that we have, but second, it should stir you into some state and position of action, into declaration, into going to war in prayer, and preparing in person. If you don't want to, that's on you. It's not on God. If this place goes sideways and all the self-interest consumes them, that's on us. Kind of on them, more so on us. We're the ones that put people in power because we keep looking at it naively. We have to stop. At a certain point, we need to come to terms with ourselves and say like, wow, we're actually allowing this to happen. Yes, we are. Why? Because we believe somehow naively that God will still answer our prayer and correct the ship when we refuse to do any heavy lifting. We don't pray. We don't love God. We don't honor God. We don't honor his word. We don't seek his face. We don't seek his prophecy. We don't take anything that he has to offer seriously. Why do we keep expecting God to be taken for granted and give us all of his best when we give him our least. So Friday, September 1st, 2023, it's about 4.40 in the morning. Listen, this, this is just a warning. We've been warned and this is how much we disregard it and take it for granted. What does the Bible say? Don't exalt anything above the Lord your God. You will not lift anything up above God and his right standing with us in our lives. What is stuff like this? Its existence is an exaltation. Its existence is something that man has basically said, like, look at us, look what we can do, and look what we can build. The warnings are clear. We think just because other men built it, and it still stands, that it's fine, that it's not on us, that the guilt is not on us for actually allowing it to stand. Okay, so let's look at Gideon. What did Gideon do? Gideon tore down all the high places, all the altars. Look at Abram. What did Abram do with his father, Terah? He tore down the altars, and even then backed himself up and said, oh, you know, if they are truly gods, why didn't they protect themselves? If you think that we can somehow escape this and just say like, oh no, it's not something exalted above God. We've put up an entire obelisk. It is just a, a pagan structure in the middle of our nation. And we try and tell ourselves, oh no, it's, it's not us. We didn't do that, it's someone else. So, you know, we can't be held guilty and responsible for it. Think from a godly term that's aimed right at God. God's not taking it lightly. At a certain point, I declare, I pray, this place come falling down violently. Every high place will be torn down, every single one of them, in the name of Jesus. It will not stand. Not one stone will be left upon another. Maybe a little fraction of it, just so we know, oh yeah, that's where that thing was. Just as a reminder, we are on borrowed time. We're at the end of borrowed time. I feel like we've exhausted all facets of borrowed time, but you know, praise God. That's on God, right? Not on us. That's it. God bless. God speed. Pray against this thing. Pray against everything it stands for. Maybe we have a dog in this fight and God will not uh, bring an utter end to us. Maybe. Maybe he will. We're still in heaven, right? Because we're Christians, right? All dogs go to heaven. No rest for the wicked. I don't know. Something like that. See ya. Bye.